Hello, Rune Scholar, wherever and whenever you are. I'm the Modern Aralar. In episode 5, I described the first deviations from the Elder Futh arc during the Bracteate period. New runic layouts, longer inscriptions, sound changes, and two new runes, as both runic Frisian and Old English evolved out of the earlier Proto-Scandinavian language. During the 8th century, the Anglo-Saxon rune set expanded to the largest Futh arc that has survived, a system of runes reflecting the influences of the language spoken in what was to become England, as well as the Latin literary tradition of Christianity. We start to see inscriptions and texts based on what we can refer to as the Anglo-Saxon Futh work by about 750 CE. I'm using an alternate spelling and pronunciation here with an O and a C rather than an A and a K when I spell and say Futhork because of the linguistic shift from A's to O's in Anglo-Saxon and the monastic preference for the C over the K. It's a typical distinction among runologists, so it will be helpful for you to know it. To put this evolution into a wider context of runic developments, after the Bracteate period, continental runes diverged from Scandinavian developments and fossilized, developing only conservatively on the continent, while the Scandinavian runes continued to evolve into their later forms. Scandinavian and continental developments both influenced English runes after about 450. The runic system in England experienced more innovation than that on the continent and expanded. This is different than happened in Scandinavia, and it may be because of the close connection to Latin scriptoria, as seen in ecclesiastical runic monuments and the abundant use of runes in manuscripts. Latin and runic scripts coexisted in Anglo-Saxon England for nearly 400 years, suggesting literacy in both languages concurrently. Sometimes both appear together on the same artifact, as in the case of coins where the king's name appears in Latin letters and the moneyer's name appears in runes, or as you can see here, in the Frank's casket, where most of the script is vernacular in runes, but this back plate bears a Latin text in a mix of both runes and Roman letters. This combination could tell us that runes had lost any potential pagan associations in England by the second half of the 7th century. We do know that the earliest runes in England appeared in areas outside of Essex, Wessex, or Sussex, which suggests that it was the Anglians rather than the Saxons who brought runes to Britain, and the lack of runic inscriptions from Saxony would bear that out. So what sources can we access to learn about the Futhork? We know of a total of 33 runes that were used in Anglo-Saxon contexts, but not all of these runes appear in all sources, or even, all, uh, even most of them. Some appear only in manuscripts, and others appear only on artifacts, so we cannot conclude that the whole 33 rune Futhork represented a single standard across Anglo-Saxon time and space. So with that caveat, let's discuss some of the notable sources for this Futhork. The Vienna Codex, or the Codex Vindibinensis 795, and previously called the Salzburg Codex 140, is at the Austrian National Library in Vienna. It was compiled from late 8th century material, including a Gothic alphabet, and generally associated with the monk Alcuin. It contains a descriptive compilation of 28 runes only. 
It represents what is likely to be the earliest surviving rune forms and Futhork order within a cohesive whole, and most reconstructions of the Anglo-Saxon Futhork rely very heavily on it. Lists of runes also survive in other manuscripts, including uh, the Cotton Manuscript Demission A9, Birtfirth's Manuscript of the 12th century, and the Codex Sangalensis 878, a 9th century manuscript currently in the Swiss Abbey of St. Gaul, and which may have originated in the Abbey of Fulda. It includes this table of Anglo-Saxon runes, a younger Futhark, and a copy of the Abbasidarium Nordmanicum. I referred to this manuscript earlier in episode 4 as a source for recreating the Elder Futhark. We have a rune row from an artifact inscribed on a 9th century Scramasax found in the Thames River, also called the Sax of Beagnoth, after the name inscribed here on the blade. This artifact shows variations in the appearance of some of the runes as well as the order when compared with the Vienna Codex. Inscriptions in Anglo-Saxon runes appear on a wide variety of objects overall, including swords, sword fittings, brooches, and coins. We see runes surviving on monuments, like the Ruthwell Cross and the Bewcastle Cross, but we must also keep in mind that heavy damage to these monuments through weathering or deliberate defacement or well-intentioned preservation efforts makes quite a few of the runes difficult to decipher, especially when the copies or transcriptions by earlier scholars are not in agreement with each other as to the forms of the runes in as recently as the 18th and the 19th century. Lastly, we have the Old English rune poem. This 9th century or earlier composition survived in a manuscript in the Cotton Library until 1731, when it was destroyed in a fire, and survives thereafter only because a copy made by Humphrey Wanley was published in a facsimile called Linguarum Veterum Septentrionalium Thesaurus by George Hicks in 1705. It gives names for the Anglo-Saxon runes, but these may appear a little bit marginal, as if they were written in as a gloss later than the original manuscript itself was conceived, and so the names may not be original to the 9th century composition, but a later edition. So since we can't rely on a single definitive source, what do at least most of these sources agree are the names and the forms of the Anglo-Saxon runes. Fehu is now called Fey or Feo, but again meaning wealth or cattle. Urus is uh, now called Ur but the name still probably means aurochs. Torisaz is now called thorn, which is also what it means. Oz, as I mentioned, developed during the Bracteate period, during which the name means one of the gods. The Old English rune poem calls it mouth, but this may be a kenning for Woden, the god associated with prophecy. It clearly derived from the elder Futhark Onsus and absorbed the part of the name, and I discussed the sound value that it evolved in Old Frisian and Old Anglian in our last episode. The R sound again means ride, but with the name Rold or Rolda. This rune was transliterated as C and called Ken, meaning torch or brand, but this word doesn't appear much in Old English. Uh, and even though it's usually transliterated C, the sound is the CH like in Loch. 
Gifu is unchanged from Elder Futhark in form, but the name has been updated. Uh, I'll discuss new runes to account for additional G and K sounds toward the end of this Futh work, since those differentiate in the language during this period. But this one is going to be uh, the uh, voiced velar fricative that's pronounced more like a modern Greek gamma. When, joy or hope or expectation, eventually evolved into the bookhand letter win, which was adopted into the Old English alphabet and used alongside characters that came from the Latin alphabet. Hail, hail, appears in both its single and double barred forms in Anglian in particular. Need, Need or death is described in the poem as the hardest of events. The rune Esau's is now called Ease, and the name again means ice. The Old English rune poem called this rune Ger, and it remained a voiced velar fricative, like the Y in Jarl, but with more of the tongue closed against the roof of the mouth. Ao, or to give a West Saxon variant that's survived into modern English, you. This single rune may have represented a couple very related sounds, e like in rai hen, or the voiceless palatal fricative ha, like in elmaihti. It appears there in the very center of the word elmaihti. They're very close these sounds, but modern English uses the E uh, and I letters in similar ways to account for multiple sounds, and the Vienna Codex transcribes the sound as IH. This rune could face either direction, so we have uh, an additional allograph here, uh, uh, an acceptable variant uh, that appears as well as uh, the more common variant. Payorth, Hall Joy, is clearly a euphemism for something pleasurable, but it is unclear which precise pleasure that may be. Eor Sedge, a type of sedge or reed, uh, is used to represent the Z sound in Elder Futhark, but this sound does not appear in early English languages, so the rune form was reassigned to the X or X value, and appears in words like rex for king. Seagull, or sun. In England, the S sound appears in two different runic forms. Uh, this uh, form that's more zigzag shaped, that looks more like the Elder Futhark form, and this second bookhand seagull that may have evolved from the S of insular minuscule. The T sound is now called Tyr and now meaning glory. Beork again means birch. Eo again means horse. The name of this rune shortened to man, and that's again what it means. Um, but lagu, which meant both water and the vegetable leek in Elder Futhark, now only means water when it's in an English context. Ing appears as a full height version of the Elder Futhark rune. Uh, and that continues the trend I described of making full height versions of the Elder Futhark's half height runes that I described in the Anglo Frisian episode. Dyke, day. We also see uh, this form on some coins and this form on the Saxe of Beignoth or the Thames Scrama Sax. The short O is the new default O sound in Anglo-Saxon, and Odal, or which is very similar to the the Elder Futhark name Odila, 
uh, again means homeland or estate. And um, again, we have another Scramasax variant here, which may be a simplified form where the tails of uh, Odil uh, come together as a stave. We repeat oak and ash from Anglo Frisian and those developments, but Anglian, the aforementioned dialect of Old English that used both the single and the double barred Heidel runes also evolved a new rune of its own, Ar, probably meaning either grave or sea. This rune evolved because the AU diphthong of Germanic pronounced Au, um, you see it also uh, uh, evolving into Ea, the E-A diphthong in Anglian, or, or something like it. The exact sound of Old English diphthongs like Ea and Ao is still disputed, and the Ar rune is often argued to be at least 7th century in its development, but a very similar shape appeared on a sword pommel from grave 65 of the 2nd Fretun Cemetery in Padicale in France, and that may indicate that this rune appeared as early as 530 to 560 CE, and we see something similar as part of a bind rune in Kent in the later 8th century. We also see a new Y phoneme, Ur or Yubo, that seems to be a pretty transparent bind rune of Ur and Is. Its name is a Scandinavian intrusion, or a word not otherwise found in the Anglo-Saxon language. And this is one of the indicators that English runes were keeping up with Scandinavian developments. This rune first appears on the Ruthwell cross, which has been dated to between 650 and 750 CE, and this sound emerged sometime after the completion of the I mutation of the U vowel in Old English, and that occurred after 600. This was also a period of conversion to Christianity for the Anglo-Saxons, bringing with it Latin literacy, and in Latin texts, the Y sound was written as UI, so Latin script may have been an especially influential factor for this particular rune. Since the Vienna Codex only has these 28 runes, there are five more runes that we should discuss. Ralph Elliot argued that these were probably specific to Northumbria, but given that some of them appeared in other contexts further afield, I feel that the reality may be more complicated than that. After about 600 CE, we develop differences in Old English between G, K, and different CH sounds, which leads to the rune calc which means chalice, or possibly chalk, or calcaeus for sandal. Any of these names could be the correct one. And this is probably the voiceless form of the k sound. But in the Ruthwell cross, we also see it differentiated from ken, which appears in a version of the word ich, for I, myself. Uh, and it's different than this Kelk rune, which is used to transcribe the name of Christ. So these two runes may be trying to distinguish between a K formed in the front of the mouth for ich from one formed in the back for Kalk. This rune on the Ruthwell cross may be a further attempt to distinguish the kind of CH sound that you find in the word child from the sound that you hear in loch, which would have been um, what you would use for, uh, for Ken. Uh, this rune appears on the Bewcastle cross, and it may represent an attempt to distinguish between a voiced G, like in the word game, the G sound, uh, from a sound called the voiced velar fricative that we use uh, for transcribing 
gifu, um, that modern Greek yama sound where it's not the hard G. The star rune, yar or yor, could possibly mean barge or boat, but does not otherwise appear as a word in Old English dialects. This shape is the 29th rune in the Old English rune poem. In episode 5, I mentioned that this rune was used during the, uh, the Anglo-Frisian developments for the glide, uh, the y like in yarl, but it may also have represented the very similar yo, io diphthong. Some scholars believe it could have been imported from the Scandinavian yara rune of the younger futhark, which uses this same star shape, and we'll discuss the younger futhark in our next episode. But Richard Page was very skeptical of this interpretation in his essay on the rune. He believed that Geir was the more likely cognate, even if the form is not the same. Either way, the Anglo-Saxon Futhork is differentiating between several different versions of voiced velar fricatives, G's, K's, CH's, and Y sounds. And these all develop after about 600, uh, and um, we don't necessarily see this before that point. The rune Stom appeared in the facsimile of the lost manuscript Cotton Altoniensis B10165 and probably indicated the ST st sound with which its name begins. This rune and uh, the very similar allograph here uh, appeared in the inscription on one of the U ones recovered from Vesteremden, so it also appears in Frisian contexts. This last rune. Uh, doesn't mean anything that we can decipher, but it might be deliberately rhyming with Peorth earlier in the Futhork. It represents the qua or Q sound and was only used for the Latin QU combination. Some of these runes were again used ideographically. Man, Daig, and Odo were all used as a single rune to represent the full word of its name. As you can see here, uh, two different times in the red gloss lines of the Durham ritual. One Daigmon individual signed his name only using the two runes. And one of the interpretations of the Anglo-Saxon poem, The Husband's Message, or The Husband's Lament, which contains runes in lines 49 and 50, is to interpret the message of the poem according to the names of the runes. Both the Anglo-Saxon and the Danish runes were affected by greater literacy within the population. In England, where monastic use predominated, the runic revival was found almost exclusively in an ecclesiastical context. I mentioned already that the bookhand version of the Siegel rune was probably an adaptation of the insular, manus, insular minuscule s that's used by Irish scribes. And the serifs frequently seen on Anglo-Saxon runes, like you can see here in this version of the Ptolemaca Erosius, may also have been a monastic introduction. In Denmark, however, where runic writing became very widespread and almost democratized, this caused a shift toward the simpler system that we call the Younger Futhark. We will learn more about the Younger Futhark in our next episode. Please join me then. Thank you for reading the runes with me. The Modern Era.